Thanks, Arnold, and, and thanks to Manos and the organizers for the invitation uh, to be part of this great meeting. Um, so I'm going to talk about angiography-derived uh, fractional flow reserve. Is it time uh, to dump the pressure wire? I do have some important conflicts to highlight. I have relationships with CathWorks and HeartFlow. So uh, as you know, uh, coronary physiology uh, utilization in the cath lab has increased over recent times uh, to maybe about 20% or so of PCIs, but it's still uh, less than uh, optimal, uh, many people believe. And the question is, why is that? And I think there are a number of reasons. There's a perception that it takes extra time, and certainly if you don't use coronary physiology on a regular basis, it probably will take you extra time. Uh, there are some wire handling characteristics that aren't uh, ideal uh, compared with our typical workhorse wires. Pressure drift, um, of the sensor or of the cath lab system uh, can be frustrating. Uh, if you're measuring fractional flow reserve and using adenosine, that can uh, lead to side effects and, and extra time as well. Uh, it's uh, expensive, although uh, studies have shown overall it leads to uh, cost savings. Um, and there is a small risk, of course, every time you put a wire into a coronary vessel. And so if you look at these uh, different issues that are all related to uh, the need for a coronary pressure wire. So if we could have a method of uh, getting the information of uh, fractional flow reserve and coronary physiology without having to place a wire and use adenosine, obviously that could streamline our approach and, and would be an ideal scenario. And so fortunately, there are now three uh, systems available in the United States that derive uh, fractional flow reserve from the, the angiogram, the images uh, we take in the cath lab. There's FFR angio from CathWorks, QFR uh, from Metis, and uh, VFFR from Pi Medical. And we have emerging uh, data supporting uh, the validity of these uh, techniques. This is uh, a study looking at QFR where it was compared with wire-based uh, FFR in 328 lesions, and you see a very nice correlation with uh, uh, very reasonable diagnostic characteristics, sensitivity, specificity, and accuracy of 95, 92, and 93 percent. Uh, we also have data with VFFR, where it was compared with pressure wire-based um, FFR in 100 patients, and the area under the curve was 0.93. And then finally, a study I was involved in, the FAST FFR trial. This was a multi-center uh, study, including 10 uh, different centers from the US, Europe, is, and Israel, uh, where uh, FFR was measured with a pressure wire in 319 vessels and then analyzed in a blinded fashion by a core lab and compared with uh, FFR angio measured again in a blinded fashion by a separate core lab. And as you can see, there is an excellent correlation, sensitivity, specificity, accuracy of 94, 91, and 92 percent. This uh, was expanded further uh, in a pooled analysis, including 700 vessels, and again showed uh, excellent diagnostic characteristics in a larger uh, patient population. So uh, because I'm most familiar with FFR and NGO, I'll spend a few minutes just uh, talking about how this actually works. Um, unlike uh, heart flow, for example, and CT FFR, uh, FFR angio doesn't use computational uh, fluid dynamics, and that's part of the reason why it can be done much more quickly. Uh, the key aspects to the measurement are, one, getting uh, good images so that the system can create a three-dimensional reconstruction of the coronary tree, and then based on that, the arterial network is modeled as an electrical circuit, as you see here, with each segment acting as a resistor. And the vessel's resistance is estimated based on the length and diameter of the vessels. And each vessel's contribution to flow um, is based on its impact on overall resistance, depending on this arrangement. So basically, the system estimates the resistance in a normal setting, and then it factors in the stenosis based on the three-dimensional reconstruction, and it compares the flow in that setting uh, to the normal setting, uh, and it estimates what hyperemia would uh, do to the to flow. And so this is an example of how we do it in the cath lab. So basically, you take your uh, baseline images. You like to get at least two or three uh, orthogonal projections of the vessel of interest. And 
practically what can you, you can do is after you do, for example, your left coronary while you're uh, doing your right coronary pictures, your assistant can be uh, going ahead and measuring uh, the FFR angio in the left system. So it's really a, a seamless um, uh, in, in, uh, introduction to the cath lab. So how do we do this? Um, th this is the first uh, sort of um, uh, slide that you'd see on, on the system and you basically choose the artery that you're interested in, you put in the mean arterial pressure and then you click next and then uh, automatically the images have been input into the system and you choose um, uh, three orthogonal projections, in this case of the LAD, and then there's a little uh, circle with a plus sign there and you just place that on the, the uh, lesion of interest and then click next and then it takes about 30 seconds to maybe a minute and the system will automatically generate um, tracings of the lumen and you can double check these. I try not to adjust them at all, um, but if there you know, is some overlap or sometimes if like a pacemaker wire is in the way, the system can get confused and you have to correct that, but usually it does a pretty good job. And then uh, once you're happy with that, you click next again and then in another 30 seconds to a minute. So overall this takes you know, maybe two to three minutes uh, your FFR angio shows up. And it, it, on the left-hand side is a three-dimensional reconstruction. You can rotate that and look at the relationship with the lesion uh, to the side branches and so forth. You can also uh, do a virtual uh, um, stenting uh, planners where you, you know, virtually implant a stent and see what effect that would have and the length and the diameter to help plan your PCI. So in this case, uh, the FFR angio was significant. We went ahead and stented, uh, and then uh, you see you can do a follow-up uh, FFR angio afterwards, too, to check your work. So what data do we have to support uh, this approach? Um, China has been leading the way uh, with the QFR system. This is the Favor 3 China study that was presented last fall at TCT. is a multi-center sham controlled randomized trial comparing QFR guided PCI with angio guided PCI in uh, over 3,800 patients, so quite a large study. The primary endpoint was death MI or ischemia driven revascularization at one year. In essence, this was kind of a re, uh, reproduction of the FAME-1 trial, but using uh, angiography derived uh, FFR instead of uh, wire based. And uh, what they found was that um, MACE was significantly reduced, uh, primarily due to reduction of MI and ischemia-driven revascularization. Uh, you can see that very early on, there was separation of curves, presumably related to procedural MI. Um, so the investigators also did a secondary analysis eliminating uh, periprocedural MI, and you see that there's still a significant reduction of MACE at one year uh, with the uh, QFR-guided approach. Um, there's also uh, been data looking at the outcome of deferred lesions and the safety of that using uh, FFR angio. This was a study of almost 500 patients where about half of them were deferred based on the FFR angio and then they were followed for a year and you can see that the deferred lesions had a lower uh, event rate which is reassuring uh, compared to the revascularized uh, patients. So what's next? Well, as you can imagine, uh, this system might have implications as far as assessing the microvasculature, a growing area of interest uh, to us in the cath lab. And the index of microcirculatory resistance, which is an index we can measure with a pressure wire using a thermal dilution technique, um, and which has been shown to uh, be prognostic in, in a number of settings, uh, this has been evaluated using uh, the QFR system, uh, meta system, to uh, derive an, an angio-derived IMR. And in this study, they compared uh, the two and showed a reasonable correlation. Another group uh, did a retrospective study looking at uh, about 300 patients with STEMI who had primary PCI, and then they, they uh, measured IMR angio, and then they looked at outcomes based on the patients with an elevated uh, microvascular resistance, you know, implying more damage to the microcirculation and those with uh, lower uh, IMR angio, and they found a, definitely significant difference in event rates, which has also been shown with the wire-based system, but clearly this could uh, make it a lot easier to do, especially in the STEMI setting. 
So uh, how close are we? Well, it's here. Um, it's available uh, uh, in your cath lab. Um, so I encourage you to uh, check out these systems. What do we do next? Well, I think we need uh, more data, more real world data. We need to learn uh, the limitations of the systems, which, which scenarios uh, we have to be careful with um, and the accuracy in those scenarios. And we need more clinical outcome data. Sorry, some feedback there. Um, and we need to continue uh, to refine and streamline uh, the measurements to make them even easier and quicker to do in the cath lab. And then hopefully this will lead to incorporation to the guidelines and help with things like reimbursement. Thank you for your attention. Great overview, Bill. Uh, just a quick uh, question. Would you, would you venture a guess as to what the outcomes would be from these non-inferiority trials against FFR with the virtual FFRs? Yeah, you know, I think that um, given the various uh, studies comparing to the pressure wire and showing very high correlation, if you use the analogy of the, the IFR studies like Sweetheart and Defined Flare where, you know, the correlation is only about 80 percent compared to 90 plus percent, and th those methods were non-inferior, I think that these should also be non-inferior. Um, you know, I think the uh, sort of message is that using some physiology is better than none, whichever method you choose and works best for you. Great, and then the actual, uh, the question for the, the talk was, is it time to dump the pressure wire? I have to invoke, uh, you know, I asked Justin Davies this question. He said, well, the pressure wire is still improving. Um, maybe you can answer the title of your talk. What, is it time to dump the pressure wire? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I think, as I mentioned, what we need next, I, I would uh, feel more comfortable dumping the pressure wire when I have some more um, outcome data, particularly, you know, in the United States. And so I think studies like that would really help um, because there are still scenarios uh, and learning the limitations where you have, in my opinion, too much overlap of the vessels and you can't really image the the stenosis well enough that I feel comfortable with the result. I mean, maybe I'm wrong. I think we need more data in those challenging subsets, but there are still cases where I'll bring out the pressure wire. Great. Uh, Farshad? Well, it's uh, awesome. Uh, I guess two, three years ago, you come to CVI and talk about dumping pressure wire in front of Bill Ferron. I think uh, you won't uh, uh, get a response from your high, but uh, it's amazing. Thank you for the great talk, great technology. So what do you think about the tandem lesions? Are you gonna do multiple measurements to figure out which one you treat? And, and also, how about the tortuosities? With the experience with the CTFFR, I've seen a lot of positives. I know the way the calculation is different as you explained, but what are your experience on those two topics? Well, I think the, the tandem lesions, it, you know, it, theoretically, the angiography systems might even be more accurate than the pressure wire um, because you can virtually remove one of the stenoses ahead of time and then you know assess the remaining one which is what you'd like to do in practice in the cath lab but you can't really do without actually stenting the lesion uh, with the wire based system i'm saying so uh, yeah i think that there could be some advantage in the tandem lesions i think um, you know compared with uh, CTFFR, this system looks like, I mean, there haven't been a lot of studies comparing the two, but it looks like with a wire-based system, it looks like it's probably even more accurate, which is not surprising because the resolution of the angiogram is better than the resolution of the CT coronary angio. So yes, there are going to be limitations in certain patient subsets, but hopefully it'll be less than what we see in CTFFR. I have a question. Um, even if we have uh, clinical outcomes data, what barriers do you see in the future in getting this thing approved uh, into clinical practice in the United States? Well, I, I mean, I think it's already approved, so we, we can use it. Getting uptake, um, I think, with clinical outcome data and guidelines, that'll help. I, I think um, the logistics of it, you know, both uh, streamlining its implementation in the cath lab, which have come a long way already, I'll say, um, but there can be some further um, modifications that can improve that. And then I think that, as always, the reimbursement and the, you know, the, system, the setup for, uh, we talked about this the other day, how, you know, whether it's a prescription uh, or subscription, I should say, model, or you pay for each one. I think things like that will also impl have implications on uptake. 
Last comment, Lou. Yeah, great talk. I'm interested in a little further perspective on the Faber 3 trial. What's your perspective on the mechanism of benefit? Was it similar to fame in that it led to deferral of PCI, or was there a separate benefit with QFR? Uh, my sense was it was similar. Um, there were fewer stents placed um, in the, uh, the QFR guided arm, and so I think, you know, doing less in this case sometimes is, is better, and so that's what I think was the main driver. Great, let's move on to... One, one quick question. So is, is there any... Uh, so do you need a specific type of catheters, a specific type of injection? Um, do you need, I mean, because, you know, you see angiograms from angiograms, and then you see, you know, one of the complications of diagnostic angiography is taking a non-diagnostic angiogram. So the quality of the angiograms need to be improved, right? And then the type of abuse that you use and everything has to be regimented. Yeah, that's an excellent question. Thanks for bringing that up. Um, you know, in general, uh, this, I think these systems are going to make us better angiographers because a lot of times we're a little lackadaisical and we don't really pay a lot of attention to the panning and the setup. And you do need to do a little bit more of that. The ideal scenario is when you have the whole coronary tree in the field without having to do significant panning. Um, you don't need to use any special catheters. I mean, diagnostic catheters are fine. Any approach is fine, whether you use um, an automatic injector or manual all that's fine. I mean, you do need to do a good angiogram. You need to fill the vessel with contrast. And uh, yeah, and the angles, they don't need to be special angles. You just, you know, an REO cranial, AP cranial, LAO cranial for the LAD, and, and same thing, caudal views for the CERC, you know, that kind of thing. Great. So our next talk uh, is from Farouk Jaffer from MGH. It'll be, it's entitled Coronary CTI, CTA for PCI planning, not just for tavern planning, but PCI planning. Good morning, thank you. Thanks for being here, and again, thanks for the invitation. This is really a great conference, and glad to be a part of it. Thanks for the diehard sticking here in the last session. So coronary CTA for PCI planning, delighted to present on this. These are my disclosures, mostly related to imaging. All right, so how can health CT help in guidance for PCI? So um, I'm glad I reread the title because I thought it was going to be really about CTO PCI guidance, but there actually has been some updates in using CT for non-CTO PCI as well, and we'll just briefly talk about those. But those really focus on defining the optimal angles. There was a nice study that was uh, informative. CTFFR, I'm not going to talk about that in detail. We know how this has really transformed our approach to diagnostic um, uh, cornea angiography when we come in, expecting certain uh, FFR significance. We have our eye on the prize, um, uh, looking for lesions that are significant, already tipped off by CT. Um, a more recent uh, advance is the idea of using a virtual CT planner, just like Bill spoke, for virtual PCI planning based on angio FFR. There's a similar solution now for CT as well. And then for CTO PCI, there's clinical data um, that really shows the value of it and um, uh, for pre planning as well as for real time fusion. So um, this was just a, a nice summary of about 100 patients that um, had CT angiograms, and the authors spent a fair amount of time um, optimizing and rotating and really looking for the least amount of foreshortening and the greatest definition and um, you know demonstrated some things that I think we've heuristically come to realize when we're doing um, coronary intervention especially in the ostium of the left main and right coronary um, but it was I thought this was really interesting that they kind of identified very specific angles looking at, at least an average population so the LAO cranial um, shot is really, uh, was found to be the most helpful for the left main ostium for deployment. Um, that's a useful heuristic, 3722, which is certainly something that most scan, uh, systems can attain. The left main bifurcation, also a really important zone. Um, we always talk about going max caudal. Um, this may be, you know, 50 degrees might be pushing it, but I think that concept of going max caudal um, for exposing that bifurcation is, um, was validated here. And then for the RCA ostium, which I didn't think I really appreciated um, how severely angulated one needs to be, probably not possible to really attain this in a general um, practice, but um, really helping us still realize that LEO cranial um, as maximum as we can go is going to be helpful for exposing that. Um, so one of the other um, uh, interesting concepts is whether or not we can get more out of CT, and CTFFR is certainly um, here to stay and has been probably most helpful excluding um, intermediate stenoses that are clinically significant 
uh, from going to the cath lab and being um, found to be ischemic. But in the subset of, uh, of lesions that are ischemic with CTFFRs that are abnormal, um, wouldn't it be interesting to do pre-PCI um, planning? So this was a really interesting um, study where um, uh, the authors um, in Europe uh, did a study where they performed baseline CTFFR, then they performed um, a motorized FFR pullback, um, using kind of a specialized system, and at that time um, performed OCT pre-PCI to understand the minimal luminal area. Then they performed the PCI, did OCT again, and did a motorized FFR pullback, and looked to see how accurate the virtual CT planning was. So. Um, basically, using the uh, initial um, instrument where they had uh, the CTFFR, they were able to um, decide on putting in a virtual stent and then predict what the post-PCI FFR would be and the post-PCI MSA um, by CT. And you can see on the right, there's a very, very good um, agreement between the post-PCI FFR predicted by CT as well as the actual gold standard with invasive FFR. In addition, there was a very good correlation, an R value of about 0.84 for the MSA from OCT and the MSA from FFRCT. So this is really great, right, that we can get some insights into what our um, actual interventional strategy might be even before the patient is um, on the table. Um, and so the, for the final part, I'll just um, talk about um, CT guidance in helping CTO PCI. Um, as we've heard, um, uh, it's so important to do a diagnostic angiogram, and some of our patients um, who have um, CTOs are not necessarily recognized to have that at the initial shots, and the amount of collateral filling is ambiguous. We've had many patients where the target is, quote, invisible, but CT has shown that the target is present, and this has given us confidence to proceed with either PCI or cabbage in, in some of these situations. Probably the most important part of CTO-PCI uh, for CT fusion is, uh, and CT pre-planning is to actually clarify proximal cap ambiguity, and I'll show a case of that. Um, vessel course ambiguity, especially long right total coronary occlusions, dissecting, understanding if we're deviating off course going to RV marginals or lower RV branches, very helpful to have a CT overlay. Um, we can better appreciate calcium, and I'll show an example of that. Um, I think one of the other um, aspects that's very helpful is that when we're working with osteal CTOs, it's sometimes really important to understand if it's truly flush occluded. And diagnostic angiography can be sometimes incomplete if it's not well seated. If it is, I think you know, the, the potential need to go retrograde and to use more advanced techniques is kind of pre-identified and that's helpful. And then there's options for both pre-planning and real-time fusion. So um, this was one of the, I think, most um, initial foundational studies that really helped us understand that CT does a better job at understanding the coronary angiogram, a coronary um, pathology than a diagnostic angiogram in general. So this was a comparison trying to understand the differences between X-ray angiography and CT angiography at understanding the definition of blunt versus tapered, um, how much bending there was in the vessel, what, how severe the calcification was and what the occlusion length was because again, with collateral filling, sometimes it's a variable amount of cine time. This showed that CT was actually better at predicting procedural success and 30 minute guide wire crossing compared to X-ray angiography. So because the CT is obtained in steady state when there's 100 milliliters of contrast injected into the body, we really have distal collateral filling at the same time of proximal vessel filling that gives us the ability to really look at these details in greater, um, uh, greater resolution. And of course, calcium is clearly much more sensitive. So um, um, this randomized trial is worth uh, mentioning. This was uh, published in Jack Imaging last year, looking at the role in a randomized trial of CT planning for CTO-PCI. And this was pre-planning of approximately 400 patients. And um, the overall analysis showed that there was a 94% rate, success rate in patients who underwent CT guidance ahead of time versus just standard angiography guidance, which had an 84% success rate. When they looked at the subgroup analysis, this was really most emphasized in the JCTO greater than or equal to two subcategory. Um, as far as um, uh, MACE rates, which were shown in the bottom column, it was uh, suggestive of a trend, but not significant. Um, of note, with these are small numbers, but the perforation rate was lower in the CT guidance uh, range. The mechanism of why it's so much better is not fully elucidated, but this is the clinical data, so in encouraging for using CT guidance. 
I'll just finish with um, uh, a minute on um, real-time CTO fusion, and this is the idea of actually extracting those CT center lines from the CT angiogram and then fusing them at the time of coronary angiography to have them right on the screen. Um, and the reason this is valuable is because in the CTO segment, there is a gap. We do not have contrast. And so we really rely on the CT to give us the course because it can see the vessel wall both for plaque uh, and uh, calcium even without contrast in the lumen. Uh, this was a case that we had uh, shown um, several years ago, um, trying to understand mechanisms of anti-grade dissection reentry, success and failure. This was an attempt where we um, looked back retrospectively when we had CT fusion at the time and found that in fact um, we had failed in an area and why was that the case? We associated with finding, trying to re-enter in a big block of calcium. And um, when we bobsledded and moved the Singray system um, and were successfully re-entered, um, when we looked at the fusion data, we'd actually been um, placed in between two blocks of calcium. So this is kind of a, an insight into helping us understand. Um, I think we know this as operators that if we have choices, we will try to avoid severe calcium, but this just really emphasizes that part. And then final, final case, I'll just uh, demonstrate that with um, uh, the real advantage, I think, here for CT guidance is resolving proximal cap ambiguity. This was a mid-right total occlusion. You can see in the middle panel, really ambiguous origin um, in this patient who was um, very symptomatic post-cabbage. Um, and one can use um, various techniques like real-time IVUS or just a pre-procedural IVUS to, to actually identify these caps, sometimes not always clear, uh, clearly seen by IVUS. Um, the, um, um, uh, approach was to use real-time CT fusion, and so we had the CT center lines here fused onto the X-ray fluoroscopy system. Now, this is not gated, so the, the um, fluoroscopy will move, um, but the center lines won't move, so you have to kind of manually toggle them left, right. Um, but we were able to kind of see relatively what the angle uh, was between the RV marginal and the mid-right coronary. This gave us um, uh, the confidence uh, when we were not able to engage it with a jacketed wire, we used a blocking balloon at the mid right, at the RV marginal origin. We placed it right where we thought the bifurcation was, used a stiff wire, and then were able to have more confidence that we were stay, gonna stay in the architecture. That wire knuckled and eventually led to a dissection reentry strategy that was successful. So just to summarize again and conclude it, that we have options that CT has really changed our approach for um, coronary intervention and non-CTO PCI, very helpful to define optimal angles for viewing. CTFFR, as we discussed, and a virtual planner now is available, um, at least in a clinical research capacity. For CTO PCI, probably the most important part is to resolve proximal cap ambiguity and to clarify the distal target, and this can be useful both pre and in real-time uh, scenarios. Thanks so much, I appreciate your attention. Great, <laughs> uh, beautiful talk, for, thank you. Um, just a reminder uh, in the audience, if you have questions, it looks like we have one over there. Yeah, go ahead and while we're getting the mic over there, I'll just ask you, Farouk, can you um, describe how often you're using pre, uh, for your CTOs, pre-CTA planning? Sure, um, it's increasingly common because um, patients are now being screened just in general coronary disease and angina with CT. So once we have access to the CT, our, my research, uh, clinical research coordinator can segment these in about 10 or 15 minutes and I'll spend about two minutes just kind of cross-checking it. So it's pretty straightforward to do. I love to use it in the post-cabbage situation. Those are some of the hardest um, ones. We use it in any failure that we've had. We definitely go back and look at that. Farouk, that was a great talk. Um, I think Bill took my question, but I can ask another one. Um, Paul Pumipana from UH. Um, over time, I have become more of a believer in um, a CT uh, for CTO PCI. Um, I used to be zero, and now I'm more like five to 10%. Do you have a percentage about how many patients in your CTO practice that you're uh, doing CT uh, pre-procedure planning for? Sure, so um, I think it probably is about 20% to 25%, and again, really for the more complicated ones um, and concerns where we have uh, a lot of ambiguity, that really drives it. And I think you know, Manos had published this in your intervention, that's probably the most important indication um, and that about a third of those patients um, really have proximal cap ambiguity as the main indication. I think one more, one more subgroup is when you don't see the distal vessel well, sometimes it's very hard to visualize the distal vessel and then it might, it might help uh, there as well. But I agree with Farouk, the ambiguity is a big one. 
Uh, great, thanks, Farouk. I think we're running a little bit behind, so we'll go ahead and uh, move on. Um, our next talk uh, is going to be by David Kinzari, and uh, it titled uh, "Is Renal Denervation Coming Back?" All right. Good morning, everybody. Um, this is a welcome opportunity to be here with all of you. We're covering a lot from social media to cath works to renal denervation and radiation, among other things. But uh, to share with you an evolution of the evidence with regard to renal denervation therapy, and my disclosure is related principally to research and grant support, modest consulting honoraria from the interventional device industry, and recognizing that hypertension is the world's leading cause of death and disability, that uh, and against the background of patient non-adherence to pharmacologic therapies and lifestyle interventions, 60% of individuals with hypertension still persist with uncontrolled hypertension, not meeting societal or guideline recommended treatment goals in the United States as well as abroad, opens the opportunity, invites the potential for device-based therapies for hypertension such as renal denervation. Indeed, we now have five successive sham-controlled randomized clinical trials against the background of the predecessor Hypertension 3 study now demonstrating not only statistically significant but clinically relevant reductions in, in, in blood pressure, both by office and systolic measurements, and interestingly, by two different technologies, intervascular delivery of radiofrequency energy as well as intervascular ultrasound. Indeed, across these separate trials, there's a remarkable consistency of an always-on effect of renal denervation therapy. That is, when we assess blood pressure over a 24-hour period by ambulatory assessment, there is a constant reduction in the blood pressure at all time periods, which is distinct, of course, from the sham control groups in the right-hand panels, but it's also remarkably distinct from the limitations of pharmacotherapies with regard to drug dosing regimens, pharmacokinetics, patient adherence, and it may be of especial relevance to those individuals whose blood pressure phenotype conveys a high risk for adverse events, such as those with early morning or nocturnal hypertension. Renal denervation therapy has also proved to be exceptionally safe. In a pooled analysis of the spiral trials, for example, with a more so termed aggressive technique of applying radiofrequency energy into the distal branch vessels of the renal artery architecture, the procedure appears to be exceptionally safe. To date, over 1,000 patients have been treated with this particular method with no evidence of renal artery uh, stenosis identified through intermediate term imaging, through CT, MR, and, and ultrasound in the spiral program, no evidence of renal artery stenosis, no disturbances to the renal artery architecture as well, such as perforation or dissection or other major adverse events. And altogether, in a meta-analysis of 52 studies involving renal denervation therapy, if but anything, not only is the uh, glomerular filtration rate renal function preserved, but there are studies suggesting that expectedly as we improve blood pressure, we may mitigate against the annualized decline in GFR that would be expected of a hypertensive patient population. And moreover, in meta-analysis of 50 trials, totaling nearly 5,800 patients and more than 10,000 patient years of follow-up, the incidence of renal artery stenosis after renal denervation therapy is indeed less than that which would be expected from historical controls with similar like populations of atherosclerotic disease risk. We're also evolving, perhaps, in how we do the procedure. One such example is a small pilot study, the spiral distal study of 50 patients in which we're performing radiofrequency energy delivery more targeted to the distal main artery and the branch vessel segments which is an anatomic site in which the renal efferent and afferent nerves may be more susceptible to re radiofrequency energy ablation. But another is uh, shown here with the Paragon system from Ablative Solutions in which three 14,000 inch diameter nitinol needles are advanced into the perivascular space to permit delivery of 0.6 milliliters of dehydrogenated alcohol into the perivascular space. This is an animal model simply with contrast injection, but simply highlights the confluent arc of ablation that could be achieved with, re with renal denervation using this particular method. And the international pivotal target BP1 clinical trial is well more than halfway through enrollment and expected, expected to complete its enrollment by the end of this calendar year. In clinical practice, one of the questions raised by the medical community is what is the expectation for blood pressure reduction with, radi with, with renal denervation therapy? And in part, this, this is dependent upon the baseline severity of hypertension, but that said, in a moderate uncontrolled patient population, the blood pressure reductions are generally around 9 to 10 millimeters mercury by office measurements 
and five millimeters amb by ambulatory assessment, which are deemed clinically relevant, of course, but relative to medical therapy in a meta-analysis of over 350,000 patients of pharmaceutical trials with a single antihypertensive medication, keep in mind and, and to level set expectations that our drug therapies translate to roughly a five millimeter reduction in systolic office, systolic blood pressure, not ambulatory. And if but anything over longer term follow-up, there's a waning efficacy of pharmacotherapies likely due to patient non-adherence. So putting it in perspective, if we think about from larger previous trials in the hypertension space that a 10 millimeter reduction in office systolic blood pressure translates to a 10 to 15 percent reduction in mortality and 25 percent reduction in stroke or myocardial infarction. Similarly, with radiofrequency and intravascular ultrasound denervation, we're achieving an estimated roughly 8 percent reduction in mortality, the potential to do so, and a 10 percent reduction in major adverse events. Durability is also a topical discussion in the radio, renal denervation space. There has been some suggestion that perhaps the renal afferent and efferent nerves could re innervate, but this does not seem to be likely. And certainly in clinical practice, through three years of follow up in the Global Simplicity Registry, there are persistent, sustained reductions in blood pressure after renal denervation therapy that cannot be explained by an escalation in, in drug dose or medication number. And moreover, recently we presented as a late breaking trial at the American College of Cardiology and published in the journal Lancet the three year follow up of the randomized, sham controlled randomized spiral HTN on meds clinical trial, again demonstrating, if but anything, through three years, a continued divergence and amplification of the benefit of renal denervation therapy with a nearly 19 millimeter reduction in 24 hour ambulatory blood pressure complementary to medicines through three years of follow-up and a maintenance, if not divergence, compared to the sham control group, and importantly, against the constant background of medications, both in dose, number, and class, that if anything were higher in the sham control group, which if anything would bias against the differences observed with renal denervation therapy. And indeed, we see again this constant always on effect with renal denervation therapy through three years of follow-up. We see it now slightly greater compared to baseline or, or the primary endpoint in the sham control group, but this is because after three years, the medications have been escalated in these patients to achieve better blood pressure control. But still, with renal denervation therapy, more than two, a roughly twofold greater number of patients achieved a blood pressure of less than 140 through three years of follow up. And we recently presented two at EuroPCR as a late breaking clinical trial time and target range that was nearly double that for achieving adequate or optimal blood pressure control after renal denervation therapy. In the Global Simplicity Registry, also a EuroPCR late breaking trial presentation. We achieve a similar prevalence of blood pressure control with time and target range, and it seems to escalate annually as, as time goes on. But what's relevant in this analysis is that it shows for the first time with, radi with renal denervation therapy that if patients achieve greater than 50% time and target range, they achieve the lowest risk of death, of, cardi of myocardial infarction, and of stroke. And for those individuals in a linear fashion who achieve no time and target range, expectedly they have the highest rate of, of, of irreversible major adverse events. Radio frequency and intravascular ultrasound delivery of radio, radio energy delivery for our radio renal denervation also has the opportunity to reduce the medication burden. We've demonstrated this in the win ratio analysis, for example, where we have the opportunity not only to reduce blood pressure, but to reduce medication number and or dose. And this is relevant when we think about patient non-adherence because it's estimated that a third of individuals with hypertension are either completely or in inconsistently non-adherent to their medication burden. And even in the spiral on meds trial, when we sampled blood and urine from these patients with their knowledge of the intent of this sampling to detect their lisinopril, their amrodipine, or their beta blocker, for instance, 40% of the time in a clinical trial still, the patients were completely or, or at least incompletely non-adherent to their medication regimen. Whether it's in Europe or in Asia, roughly a third of individuals would favor a treatment like renal denervation rather than escalate their blood pressure medicines if indicated. And the interest on patients' behalf in radiofrequency or, or intravascular ultrasound renal denervation is similar across the levels of severity of hypertension and across the levels of the number of medications that they're, that they're taking. And this is quite disparate from healthcare providers who are more likely to refer a patient for, radi for renal denervation therapy only if they have very severe hypertension or very high medication burden. 
And perhaps the most rigorous of patient preference studies is to perform what's called a discrete choice experiment, which we recently performed in 400 U.S. individuals with uncontrolled hypertension independent of renal denervation in which we survey what is the maximally acceptable risk that you will undertake for a therapeutic procedure, whether drug or device, against the minimally acceptable benefit. And when we estimate imposed to these individuals, and this is currently under review for publication, a 10 millimeter reduction in systolic blood pressure with a durability of one year, and we've demonstrated even longer with renal denervation, and risks, either uh, procedural or long-term risks, such as restenosis, of up to 20%, which is well unheard of in the context of current evidence, still three quarters, 76% of individuals would favor a catheter-based procedure rather than medications as well. And we'll learn more about the benefit of renal denervation therapy in a more real-world patient population in the ongoing AFFIRM clinical trial, which is an international study examining patients with simply hypertension, a systolic blood pressure of more than 140, no rigorous diastolic criteria, and it will be powered to assess for chronic kidney disease, diabetes, and isolated systolic hypertension, representative of a more real-world patient population. So in summary, um, against the background of the recognition of more intensive, the benefits of more intensive blood pressure lowering, renal denervation therapy has an always-on effect. It is efficacious in sham controlled randomized clinical trials, both in the presence and absence of medical therapy. It is a safe procedure as well. And in parallel, there are an increasing number of consensus documents forthcoming on how to envelope this into clinical practice pending approval from the European Society of Hypertension, from the SCAI, the National Kidney Foundation. European uh, organizations like NICE just this week are evaluating the reimbursement for this in the United Kingdom, for instance, and several further trials are underway to further clarify its role in clinical practice. Thank you. That's an outstanding overview. We're very fortunate to have you here. We just have a few minutes for discussion. Any comments from the panel? Uh, great talk, uh, David. I mean, it's um, amazing to see how the field is uh, going on. and. Uh, I think the issue with the clinical trial in this uh, field is the by virtue of putting patients in clinical trial, you expose them to regular follow-up and monitoring, which uh, in the real world, as you mentioned, uh, for a firm spiral, uh, we may not have it. So I think the best and in your sham actually uh, results even you saw a good decrease in the sham actually uh, group too. So you kind of dilute the. Effect. So the real actual benefit is for the patients, as you said, about the third not adherent to their medications, which can be even worse in real world. Um, so are you planning to do anything specific for that subgroup of patients to look at the ones that, you know, the physicians feels this patient is not going to take their medications? Maybe we should just give them the renal denervation, see how they do, and then uh, follow up with those patients uh, long term. Um. Uh, maybe I'll, uh, if I understand correctly, so the, as an example, the AFFIRM clinical trial right now is um, enrolling patients simply with an isolated systolic hypertension of greater, or excuse me, with a systolic blood pressure, can be combined diastolic and, and systolic or not, but more than 140. So these will include patients who historically have been excluded from the current generation of sham control trials because there's no upper limit on, on, um, on systolic pressure, for instance. And um, there's no uh, requirements with regard to medications as well. So the intent, and I think in, in the medical practice, is that this therapy, like most interventional therapies, are complementary to medicines rather than at the exclusion. There is the opportunity, as I've shared, to reduce medications as well. Um, but for the, there are rare instances in which patients um, cannot tolerate medications um, uh, altogether, and um, these patients can be included in the study as well. Great talk, David. Um, a couple questions. One is, uh, when can we expect uh, commercial approval? And then the other is, um, can you just comment on some of the novel approaches uh, to denervation of other organs and clinical conditions where that might apply? Um, that uh, great two questions. Very briefly, so in um, in as I as I shared in the United Kingdom, the Nice Committee just yesterday closed their um, submission of uh, statements and letters for uh, approval and, and uh, reimbursement. France is currently um, uh, uh, moving forward with reimbursement of the technology for commercial utilization. 
And um, we're completing now the Spiral on Meds um, larger clinical trial that will be part of the package that will be submitted to FDA. And so my hope and expectation, depending on whether this goes to panel or not, will be that in the United States we would see this therapy um, roughly one year to a year and a half um, from time being commercially available. Um, with regard to other modalities of denervation, too, there's a great interest in, for example, uh, hepatic artery and, and, and in the, in the uh, splenic, uh, vascular, splenic vasculature um, uh, denervation for glycemic control, for example, um, and denervation in that regard. Um, certainly denervation for pulmonary arteries and pulmonary hypertension is still an ongoing area of interest. Your reteral denervation has also been studied as a mechanism for um, hypertension as well. Um, and, and then the other aspect, finally, is um, renal denervation, per se, but also for non-hypertension indications, which I think will get re-revisited um, for heart failure, but certainly AFib is a big one. Um, there's clear evidence that renal denervation in hypertensive patients reduces those, both the occurrence of first-time AFib but recurrence after pulmonary uh, artery ablation. Well, outstanding. Thank you so much, David, for that Thanks. update. Thanks for having me. Uh, we're going to move on and shift gears. Uh, we have Rehan Davis uh, talking about the social media revolution. What is next? And obviously, social media is heavily in the news with Twitter, so we anticipate an exciting discussion. Good morning or good afternoon now. So I'm Rianne Davies. I am uh, based out of Wellspan in York, Pennsylvania. And I'm going to be discussing social media revolution, what's next. Here are my disclosures. So as we know, social media is not only important to patients, but it's also important to physicians. Uh, so just to be aware, patients use this sometimes to find specific providers that provide a, a specific um, practice that maybe they can't find in certain locations. Additionally, it allows them the opportunity to seek second opinions. Um, it, it also helps them cope with chronic conditions. For instance, if they have heart disease or have recently undergone intervention with a stent or a new valve, they can look for new information about general well-being, diet management tips, and, and ongoing strategies for their condition. Additionally, it can open doors for latest research opportunities and other op options that stand out there. But for physicians, it helps us stay on, uh, up to date with latest peer-reviewed papers, advances in our fields of interest, allows us to get updated information quickly, as well as share research ideas, collaborate on research, and also network with colleagues, whether that's in the U.S. or across the world. Doctors are increasingly using social media to connect, and that includes a lot of us as interventionalists. With that being said, I think all of us probably have a Twitter account, and through Twitter we can learn things such as accesses, such as distal radial. This became pretty common back in 2017 on um, Twitter. The shift technique, you can find papers that are related to it, additional to alternative access, options for reperfusion sheets, PCI tips and tricks, CTO tips and tricks, and also educational posts. Uh, but with that being said, most of the time Twitter tends to be a highlight reel. So are there downsides to Twitter? Certainly, because it is open to the public and this is important for all of us to remember. Uh, when we post something, patients can see this um, and that can be a concern. Uh, sometimes patients don't allow that. Additionally, it can be peacocking in the sense that we tend to post only the cases that go really well, maybe not the cases that we have complications in. <laughs> Alternatively, like, there's a lot of ads and they can become cumbersome and annoying. It's not necessarily designed for physicians um, and it can be challenging to post cases, in which case it can make it hard to actually search for what you want to learn about. And you're not uh, following uh, specific ideas, you tend to follow people. And I will add that Twitter does ban sharing of private people's photos and videos without consent, so this is something to be aware of because you don't want to get yourself or your hospital in trouble. With that being said, though, how else can we learn and connect through social media? There's a relatively newer app called Murmur MD. This was actually developed by a group of interventional uh, or cardiology fellows um, that were looking for alternative ways of sharing ideas. And it's real world case sharing, it allows crowdsourcing of ideas and immediate help on tough cases. So they've designed this that it is private and exclusive. It's to doctors only. You have to be invited. 
It's very secure, so you don't have to worry about patients getting into these um, cases and uh, uh, descriptions that have been placed online. It's organized into groups, so you actually follow content rather than people themselves. So it's a unique posting interface that's designed to share cases, techniques, and trials. And it's easy to select multimedia from your phone. You can add comments, you can share ideas. It's very smooth and easy to use, and a little bit more in line with what we would need as physicians over Twitter. But is there anything else out there? There actually is. So Boston Scientific supports an app called Ask Angie, and I wasn't aware of this until recently. But it's an excellent uh, app that is remote support that utilizes patented merged reality technology to, to connect your cath lab staff to expert on-demand clinical support. So you really just log into this app through either your iPhone or your iPad, and through there, somebody can follow you or direct you through troubleshooting on specific um, challenges that maybe arose in the case, whether you want to learn more about maybe how to use rotational atherectomy or you're, you're stuck on an IVIS image or something's not going as planned, this is another option for you that somebody is actually on the other end and can guide you through it. With that being said, on the app, as in addition to this uh, merged reality, there's opportunities for continued education for your staff. So if they want to get um, additional refreshers on different uh, strategies, this is an availability for them. And it's HIPAA compliant, so nothing is recorded. Um, the patient information isn't stored anywhere. It's end-to-end -end encryption, which is also much approved by most hospitals. Anything else out there? There's actually CAM PCI. This is a, a program supported by AbioMed, and it allows weekly community forums um, through CAMP on Call, which can highlight different um, microcatheters, wires, different um, IVIS imaging, OCT imaging, just to get kind of a quick video on how to learn or uh, a particular uh, problem in the lab that you're trying to deal with. Additionally, there's um, bi monthly live cases. Um, there's case libraries that are interactive and searchable. There's monthly um, happy learning hour um, that occur every quarter, once a quarter, which can be very helpful. And lastly, there's um, downloadable resource, resources available, so you can download slides or information from prior conferences and learning modules. So with that being said, social media is certainly very helpful to allow all of us to connect. It ex helps us to express ideas, learn new techniques and methods, problem solve, get immediate answers and opinions, and build networks and communities. I would just aid in saying um, use caution when posting or discussion piece and in information. Thank you. Outstanding job. Um, Bill, any comments on that? Sure, yeah, that was a great talk. Uh, thanks. Um, and a question I have is, you know, I find that Twitter can be very demoralizing. Yes. <laughs> and uh, you uh, also can waste a lot of time. And so I'm wondering if you have hints. I mean, I think some of these other apps obviously are great uh, resources because it seems like, like you said, 90% of the content is sort of people you know, promoting one thing or the other, and then, you know, maybe five or 10% is educational and, uh, you know, valuable in my opinion. Uh, but how do we weed out that uh, and, and optimize our efficiency? Yeah, or do you yeah. have any recommendations? I think that can be challenging, and I think that is the advantage and disadvantage of social media. I think if there's something that you're looking for in particular or um, something that you're aware of, like a certain um, a valve and valve or um, a certain procedure that actually has um, a following and, and discussion around it, you can look at into that easier, but I think you can kind of get lost in the weeds because I think a lot of people try to post like, oh, I just did this amazing case, like look at me, and it doesn't actually help you to better your skill set. So I think it's just a matter of um, kind of finding the right app, and I would argue that Murmur MD might be a better alternative than Twitter in that situation. Let's continue down the panel. Uh, Evan, do you mind uh, commenting? Are you on social media as well? Thanks. No, that was a great overview, and I was downloading some apps while you were uh, presenting. <laughs> I hadn't heard of the Murmur one, so I look forward to seeing that. And I agree with you. I just think it's a great educational resource. It allows you to continue your education beyond just fellowship in between the meetings. Um, you know, I, I think Manos has done a great job with tutorials for step-by-step -step how to overcome um, different challenges. So no, I, I think this is the future, and I think this is certainly here to stay. And certainly the past two, two to three years of COVID really demonstrated how education has to shift to the virtual space. 
I would agree with that. And Manos has done a wonderful job with the YouTube um, teaching methods for all the fellows out there, as well as you guys with Optimize PCI. You have a website that's pretty well involved, and um, there's many opportunities, even outside of conferences, to learn from and outside of Twitter. Yeah, I've been using social media more and more. Um, I, I do think that uh, uh, in, the, in the age where we are being bombarded with a lot of education, it's kind of hard to decide the content to go for. Um, and, and just a food for thought was like, you know, what about if uh, the committees like, you know, this Jack or, or uh, sorry, the ACC or Sky come up with a professional platform uh, for the physicians in which they can uh, streamline the content that we can, we can, we can look and share our um, uh, cases. Yeah, I think that would be wonderful. Yeah, so, um, you know, I think uh, it, it can be like a, you know, a double-edged sword. So, yeah, there's a lot of benefit uh, from social media. I personally was talking actually um, before with Arnold about how I learned to do uh, single access uh, impella protected PCI from Jason Wilmot in po uh, Portland, uh, just from Twitter. And it was before the case series even was published. Uh, but at the same time, we have to be very careful, especially when we are posting a case and discussing different options because um, and especially we are you know affiliated with our own institution with our the societies you know we are FACC FSKI and you know we are giving comments so I think we need to keep that you know options open uh, the way we comment on uh, other people's opinion uh, not to be kind of exclusive so uh, because uh, from my understanding there has been some uh, litigations that people they can go and publicly find these things and there were a couple of cases that happened. So um, again, if we use it correctly, I think it's a great tool and uh, someone in each institute can be the, you know, uh, kind of a champion on this and lead the way, but uh, it is here to stay for sure. I think another advantage is also to staying up to date on the literature because information travels so quickly. I often find out about new publications from Twitter, you know, the day that it's released and it's an amazing opportunity. You also have can interact with the authors and investigators of the study. Often, you know, you see people on Twitter asking questions to the senior author, first author, and um, it's a lot more two-way communication than you would get from just a letter to the editor in, in a journal, and then maybe six weeks later, you get a reply. Free comments, Louis and Mauricio. No, I, I'm interested in the other double-edged sort of it, in that, how do you turn it off? <laughs> um, when it's there, it can hit you. Devin said, in the middle of the night when you're hanging out with your kids, and I think there's tremendous benefit. What are your practices you can turn as far as social media? You can turn it off. No, you it's definitely it. hard, but I think that comes with anything. I, I, um, I think you have to have your time away from technology sometimes, and it's a matter of, uh, if you're not on call, maybe put your phone away for a couple hours, but it's easier said than done. <laughs> One, like, one thing that I would love, uh, like to see in your presentation is what are the known no's mm -hmm. in social media. We've seen recently somebody criticizing a case that was done at another very high profile institution and then a doctor from Philadelphia that almost had to close his practice and got his privileges removed because of, uh, of, uh, of an inappropriate comment made uh, on, on, on Twitter. So we kind of go, we, we, you know, sometimes we're frontalized at the end of a, of a tough case, we're upset for something, and then we, we find the need to vent somehow, and we think that social media is a place to vent because we're just at the end very upset and very frustrated. So I think that uh, you have to count, uh, you know, to 10 before you're going to post something that, uh, that could be inappropriate, and that could have implications for your rest of your life. Yeah. Anytime I feel if you post in something on social media, you have to be wary of the fact that it's going to be out there indefinitely. So be cautious. Yeah. That's really unfortunate to hear, though. Great. Well, thank you for that uh, nice presentation. We're going to move on to our next talk. Um, Alan Jeremias is going to speak about the future of coronary physiology and imaging. Let's talk about some medicine, guys. Enough of the social media stuff. Okay, going back to fame, favorite slide. Um, as you guys are well aware, um, this is now, what, 20 years old, 15 years old? Um, randomized trial, of course, showing physiology being better than the angiogram. Um, but 
it's not just looking at one number, right? It's not like you put a wire down, you have an abnormal number, you put a stent where you think it should go because, uh, and this is where we hopefully get to the future, and it turns out the future is here, it's just that we don't use this technology, we have it available, which is this pullback, right? When we actually can determine where should you put your stent by doing these pullbacks, and so these are four different cases. They have an identical distal IFR value, 0.86, which is consistent with having a physiologically significant lesion. But as you see, the patterns of these are completely different, where you have sometimes a mixture between diffuse disease and focal lesions as on the left top, just a focal lesion on the right top, easy stent, um, some diffuse disease with a focal lesion on the left bottom, and then sometimes only focal disease. And the treatment of all of these is completely different, right? It's not the same, and it should not be based on the angiogram. And this is how it's done, very, very simple. It's just a pullback of this pressure wire under continuous fluoroscopy, as you can see on the, on the left top, and then you create this blue line um, which indicates these um, step-ups. The step-ups basically is a, is a pressure loss, and at the end um, you get this curve and you can figure out, okay, how do these um, particular pressure losses um, correlate to the angiogram and where are the actual physiologically significant lesions that you might want to treat. And so this is a case of that, um, you know, I would say in many, many institutions where neither physiology nor imaging is performed, many people would just put a stent in this is mid LAD, which angiographically appears to be the culprit lesion. But when you do a pullback, what you learn is that there is a focal lesion in that scenario for sure, but there's also a lot of disease elsewhere. And so if you did this case and you placed in this case a 23 millimeter stent in this mid vessel, what you would gain back from a physiologic standpoint would be eight IFR units. So you would end up, you add the eight to the 0.64, you end up at 0.72. Who in this room is happy with the final result of 0.72? You think your patient will be helped with that? Probably not, right? So you gotta come up with a different strategy. And, and this is available um, to you now. I'm not sure how many of you have it, but having had a few conversations in the break, I know that some of you have it and you don't use it. I don't know why. How can you not use it if you have this available? So this is the basis of, of a study that, that I'm leading um, with a number of other people. It's called Define GPS. It's going to be a randomized mm -hmm. trial of a standard of care angioplasty versus kind of this strategy. And this is one of the schematics of the training um, deck that, that we have developed for this study. And so now, basically how we're looking at these is how much physiologic loss do you get from each lesion when you do this pullback? Each of these yellow dots represents one IFR unit. And we asked the investigators to do this pullback ahead of time and then plan your case according to having less than five IUs, um, which are IFR units residual. That we consider that an optimal result that is consistent with an IFR of 0.95 or greater, which is what we learned from um, defined PCI um, being the differentiator for having a good long-term result. So in this case, how you would plan this case is to put one stent in this lesion and the proximal is four units you can leave alone. Um, of course, it's important to check after, not infrequently. There is still residual IFR units um, within the standard area because we not always get perfect results. So if you have this result, you would be done. But if you have this result, well, there is a problem in the stand, right? You have four units in the stand, so it's probably underexpanded. And we ask people to check their work after and then respond, you know, optimize the stand if necessary. And so this is one of those cases where we have uh, mid-LAD stenosis, as you see in this picture. Again, you would think straightforward angioplasty with a very, very abnormal distal IFR. Pullback shows a focal lesion. Um, a stent is, this is the calculation of how the stent is placed. Um, this is the procedure itself, pretty straightforward. Really good angiographic result. But this is what we learned from physiology, right? The IFR improved dramatically. Now it's the spot IFR is 0 0.90. In this case, um, there is um, 10 IFR units still residual, which is not an optimal result um, what in, in terms of what we want to achieve. And there is also some left within the stand. So we want people to be aggressive in this trial. We want them to go back and, and basically um, either be more aggressive with the stent in terms of balloon dilatation or image the stent and figure out is it underexpanded and then treat it um, accordingly. And so this was done in this case 
with additional PCI with um, a significant improvement, um, and then this is the final result of 0.95, which, which is acceptable. So that's kind of the concept of what um, I consider, you know, maybe how we do PCI in the future, although I guess it's available to us now. Um, in all fairness, this trial is ongoing, so we don't have the results, so I can't recommend that this should be the standard of care as of yet. But I hope that um, we're gonna find something in this trial that, that will um, support that and, and will help. You, of course, um, heard the talks earlier uh, in, in the sessions about, okay, you can do all of this ahead of time, and that's true, you can, and, and you probably should, right? This is now, this is the, the PCI planner um, from, from HeartFlow, where you can see exactly where your lesions are, and you can plan the procedure ahead of time. Um, there is now a paper um, that validates uh, the, the HeartFlow PCI planner. Um, the problem with this, of course, is that you don't have the feedback afterwards, right? You rely on this ahead of time, and I think it's a good plan to come in. At least you come in prepared. But how much that helps you during the case is obviously more questionable because you don't have um, an assessment afterwards. Using angiographic-based uh, angiographic um, FFR will give you um, a post-PCI assessment, and so these are the techniques um, currently available. This is um, one of those cases um, in which you can see that the correlation between the invasive FFR um, and, and the non-invasive was actually very, very good, and you have a post-PCI um, assessment as well. But what I'm excited about, honestly, going forward is to maybe combine everything in one tool. Um, OCT lends itself nicely because it obviously is a very, very um, high resolu resolution imaging. And so you could potentially um, have the benefits of imaging, but also have an imaging derived FFR or physiology assessment that you can also do before and after PCI. Um, and so you kind of combine two techniques in one. Um, this is basically this is the, the mechanics behind it. I don't want to go into a lot of detail, but as you can imagine, a lot of mathematics. Um, but this is the, the, the first um, data that we have, and it shows that there is a significant benefit um, over just OCT alone. As you, um, I hope, after this course are well aware, using imaging to assess physiologic significance of lesions is not the ideal method. But adding on this calculated FFR from the OCT actually um, gives you a, a much better um, area under the curve, so much better precision. And we have just completed a trial called Fusion, where we kind of look at the same thing. We um, compare the OCT-derived FFR um, to an actual FFR before and, and in cases where PCI was performed after to kind of look for um, the correlation and maybe that's how we're gonna be using this in the future. Along with these new um, AI-powered um, tools that we have available for OCT in particular, one of which is shown here, which is the calcium detection. It shows you um, pretty nicely, uh, even in the longitudinal in the bottom, the orange areas where you have significant calcification with an arc of, of more than 180 um, degrees where you want to potentially consider um, lesion modification. And of course, I think also importantly, we now have this um, AI-powered stent position analysis where we basically do a post-PCI OCT and have a full assessment of um, are we done or do we need to further optimize um, the stent um, based, based on the imaging. And then finally, we can also combine this um, for lipid detection. Um, we're still on the hunt for the vulnerable plaque. For those of you who are, maybe this is one option where we combine the imaging with NIRS um, and other modalities to detect lipid burden and um, figure out what you need to do. So don't live in the past. A lot of these technologies are currently available, um, and, and I think they're useful. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Great talk, Alan. Thank you uh, for that update. Um, regarding defined GPS, how are you um, dealing with intravascular imaging? Is it mandated? Is it allowed? Is it not allowed? And in which in each of the two different arms? So imaging is, is allowed in the trial. We wanted to make it as contemporary as, as possible. We know that imaging is performed in 15 to 20 percent of cases. And so we stratify patients. So if you declare you want to be using imaging, you have to declare it ahead of time so the patient gets stratified, but it is allowed. Of course, it's allowed as a bailout you know, at all times. And then there is also, based on the GPS protocol, certain um, situations where it's mandated in the GPS arm. So the GPS is, it is a physiology-based PCI 
um, strategy, but it's a strategy, right? It's a strategy trial. So when you see that there might be a problem, we ask investigators to go back and, and do imaging and figure out what the problem is. Great, and not getting too into the weeds, but you know, like one of the examples you showed and one of the questions I have is, you know, when you have a really low IFR, like 0.56 or whatever, I mean, essentially that's like an FFR. And, you know, in theory, then there could be more crosstalk. Um, do you see that in your cases? And is there a certain threshold of how low the IFR has to be, in your opinion, when you start have to get concerned about crosstalk and the reliability of, you know, predicting what the other lesion will do after you fix the very, very tight lesion? Yes, yeah, so maybe with, let's step a, uh, a step back here for the audience just to kind of understand crosstalk. So what Bill is talking about is that when we do FFR in serial lesions, we induce hyperemia, and because of that, um, the two lesions, they kind of interact, and so it's difficult to know the contribution of each single lesion. With IFR, which obviously is a resting index, um, it is more clear because there's a lot less crosstalk um, when there is not hyperemic flow. But having said that, when one of the lesions is critical, let's say usually more than you know 90%, and the IFR is very, very low, um, then of course that can overwhelm the system. And so our fidelity to fully analyze the second lesion is certainly um, impaired by that. Usually that happens when IFR is 0 0.50 um, or less. And the, the way around it in this case, of course, is that you just have to do an assessment post. So you fix the most significant lesion. And as you saw in GPS, it's mandated to have also a post assessment and optimization. So that would fall under that. So what are the cutoffs you suggest for yeah. posts for IFR and FFR? And uh, as you mentioned before, um, in the importance of not looking at it as a binary cutoff. Like if you have to commit to ICL LAD, to improve your IFR by like two points, you may decide not to do that. So how do you decide? Uh yeah, it's a great question. You know, you obviously have to look at the risk benefit ratio. I would say this, from most of the trials that we have from FF post PCI FFR, it appears that 0 0.90 is a reasonably good cutoff point that if you get to that point, you're probably gonna have a good long-term outcome. From defined PCI, um, we found for IFR 0.95 being an optimal result. But having said that, we modified that number for GPS because I don't want to leave um, um, a significant gradient within the stent, which indicates to me that the stent is underexpanded. So in, in GPS, you could have you know, po a 0.96 post PCI IFR, but if all four residual units are within the stent, we still ask people to go back and fix the stent because I don't want to leave that behind. Um, one quick question. Uh, also, do you think that the, the threshold for post PCI, FFR, IFR should be different for different lesion subsets? Uh, data from, uh, you know, Barry Uretsky's group uh, at University of Arkansas, they suggested different FFR values uh, for stable angina versus uh, acute coronary syndrome. So what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I don't know. If, I mean, certainly I think it's true that depending on, on the vasculature you're studying, LAD, let's say, versus, you know, other territories or clinical scenarios, the numbers could vary a little bit, but I think the variation is so slight that you know adding now different cutoff points for different vessels and different clinical scenarios will add you know the, an amount of confusion that is probably not going to be tolerated in the in the general interventional community. So I would say that's not a good idea. What do you do for those patients that um, you just can't get it high enough? I mean, there's diffuse disease, and you don't want to stent the entire vessel. Yeah, so that's a great question also, and we, we you know, it literally took us a year to, to try to come to a, a resolution, which is why the trial actually, you know, took some time to get, um, get started. We decided to treat it. So we decided to do something novel and to say, look, we don't know what, what is the best course of these patients. We think right now that maybe medical therapy is the best, but we don't know. And so we actually asked people in the GPS group to be aggressive and to stent it and to get to a, uh, you know, the best possible result you can get. Very good, we look forward to those results. All right, thank you, Nellen. Thanks, guys. Our All right, our final talk for this session is The Revolution in Radiation Protection by Simon Dixon. It's more than just about lead. Great. Well, good morning, everyone. Thanks for sticking it out to the end. And Manos, thanks for the kind invitation to the meeting here. This is kind of a tough talk to do at the end, and this won't be your typical radiation protection talk. I do hope to give you a few tips and tricks that you can take away today 
and change of practice on Monday morning. Let me ask, how many people in the room here are fellows or within five years of uh, starting the practice? So there's, there's a handful. And how many people in this room who practice interventional cardiology know the irradiation dose, know how much radiation they've received in the last 12 months? So that's a problem. So that's a real problem. So we're going we're gonna to talk about this. So this is my conflict, uh, the redefined study that I'll address this morning, received a research grant from Boston Scientific. Um, so as we consider the, the landscape of factors that impact the radiation exposure, the scatter radiation that we get, there, there are many sort of groups. And our attention is often drawn to the more expensive things like shielding and, and x-ray systems, which I will cover and discuss this morning. But I would submit today that a lot of the radiation dose is our practice. I look back over my career, 30 years in the cath lab, and the dr dramatic reductions that I've made personally to my own exposure is simply by changing practice. And these are very, very simple things they can do. One of the simplest things that you can do is to watch the, watch the gas gauge. So during the case, when you put your foot on the pedal, the air current dose usually changes to the milligrays per minute. That's how much radiation you're burning, how quickly you're going to get through the gas tank. If you're burning 80, 90 milligrays of radiation a minute compared to 30, 30, or 40, you're going to very, very quickly wrap up 4,000 and 5,000 milligrays of radiation for the case, which, which in part relates to the scatter radiation that we're going to get. So you've got to watch, you've got to go watch the gas gauge. All of us have been focused on the measures of radiation dose as a surrogate, as a surrogate of the scatter radiation dose that we all received. Fluoroscopy time is a lousy measure, so we're focused more recently on the dose area product and the erkerma dose, but I'll tell you that these, all these measures are absolutely lousy in terms of assessing how much scatter radiation that we personally received. So there's been a huge over-reliance on the measures of radiation output from the X-ray system to the scatter radiation dose that we received. The only real way, the only real way that you're going to figure out how much radiation that you've received is to wear a real-time dosimeter monitor. And I've worn one of these now for four or five years, so I know exactly how many milligrams of radiation I've received in that period of time. There are various systems on the market. And I don't care which system you use, but you've got to use a system. And for the fellows in the room here, I, I would submit that you should go back Monday morning knock on the door of your program director's office and ask for one of these radiation dosimeters to be used in every single case. All of my interventional fellows have their own personal dosimeter which they carry for the year and then hand in at the end of the year. And without this, you're never going to have the real-time feedback to make changes in your practice on a case-by-case -case basis or even within a case. Um, and here's an example. Here's a, a guy with a relatively straightforward focal lesion in the mid to distal LAD. Uh, and conversely, on the right here, a patient doing a retrograde CTO, osteocircumflex lesion, both patients relatively similar. Patient on the left, we burned about 400 milligrays of radiation, so pretty low dose from the X-ray system. Thyroid dose was 0.6 milligrams. On the other hand, uh, six or seven-fold increase in the radiation output from the X-ray system, so 3,400 milligrays for the ret retrograde CTO, but again, the thyroid dose is only 0.6 milligrams. So th these are some of my personal dose readings over the last few years. You can see here on the lower, the x-axis is, is the dose area product, and you can see here on the y-axis is the radiation dose that I received. And it's a total crapshoot. This is a scatter plot. There is no real relationship between the dose area product and what I receive here. And you can, moreover, you can see that in some cases, patients received 20, over 20,000 um, micrograys meter squared of radiation, Yet my personal radiation dose was only 0.2 or 0.3 millisieverts. On the other hand, some patients, the dose here product was very low, yet the, the radiation dose to me was quite high. And this all relates to the, the angles and how you use the radiation system. And this is one of the things that I want to help to change your practice today. We, we were all taught, and I think the radiation physicists who teach you at the start of your fellowship programs, all teach you to keep the table as high as possible which really logically makes no sense because the patient's back is the source of the radi scatter radiation in all these cases. So the higher the back is to you, to, to your eyes, to your neck, the more scatter radiation you're getting. Moreover, we've learned that the height of the operator actually makes a tremendous difference in the amount of radiation you get to your head, to your eyes, and your thyroid. So what I did with one of my fellows who's, who's, who's six feet tall is wore multiple radiate ray safe badges during the case. 
So the very safe edge at the 15 centimeters below sort of basically mimicked the height of, a, of an operator who was five foot six inches tall. And you can see here in the orange bars that the operator, the shorter operator, five, six, five feet six inches high, gets about two and a half times the amount of radiation, two and a half times the amount of radiation to the head and neck uh, compared to the six foot operator. So it's really staggering changes. And you only learn this by having a real time dosimeter during these cases. So what I do now is in most cases is try to set the table at the height of the pelvis at a sort of a comfortable level, not as the highest possible, which has been the traditional teaching. So let's switch gears now and briefly talk about some of the newer technologies. There are a number of uh, shielding systems which are designed to block the radiation reaching you, and I'm not going to cover all of these. A and they're, they're, the data here suggests that these systems in aggregate are very effective, whether it's some preclinical or some clinical data here, at a blocking 80 to 90 percent of the radiation. So I don't care which of these systems you use, they all, all work pretty well, but if you do use one of these systems, you've got to use it well, and you must, you must, must wear a real-time dosita. It makes me absolutely nuts to think that people in this country are using systems such as Rampart and other systems and, and, and not wearing lead aprons and not having any idea of how much radiation they're getting during those cases. Because even a very small leak in the radiation system can actually dramatically increase the amount of radiation that the operator receives. So if you're going to use one of these systems, and if you're going to do it without wearing lead aprons, which is approved in some states, then you've got to do it with wearing, wearing a real-time dosuna. The technology that, I've been, that I was very excited about was the control ray technology, which uses titanium blades. This is installed right above the X-ray tube and uses um, uh, titanium blades to basically create an aperture where uh, this is controlled by uh, simply drawing a line on the iPad, which just has the last store image hold to kind of create an aperture. And this could achieve dose reductions uh, of 80 to 90 percent uh, reduction. We conducted a randomized trial at Beaumont and with this technology, saw 50 to 60 percent reductions in the radiation dose to their primary and secondary operator with this technology. Unfortunately, the company last, just last month went bankrupt because of lack of funding to continue uh, moving forward. The other dirty little secret, the other dirty little secret in the field is regarding cath lab systems. Cath labs are not designed to last for 15 to 20 years. If you are operating in a cath lab that's 15 or 20 years old, you shouldn't be operating in that room. They're designed, designed to last eight or 10 years. And these are some data from the consortium in, in Michigan showing the tremendous variations in the amount of um, radiation at each institution, which can, cannot be explained by operator practice. And this is related to older X-ray systems. Even with our, or within our own cath lab here, you can see that the, the average amount of radiation output for both diagnostic and interventional procedures varies considerably based on the age of the systems, the size of the II. And you can see here that, that after the system was, was replaced, there was a substantial reduction in the radiation dose. So the age of the cath labs, the detector size, the model of the cath labs, all dramatically affect the impact of that the scatter radiation that we received. And then lastly here, how many of you have ever changed the radiation settings in your cath lab? And by mean that, I'm talking about adjusting the settings within the cath lab system itself. So here's an example. Here's the default system, 0.6 millicuries, 45 uh, uh, nanograys per pulse. We adjusted this to 0.3 and 26 nanograys per pulse, so with a, with a specific operator setting. And just doing that led to dramatic reductions in the dose area product in the air crimis setting without any significant change in the visualization. So just adjusting the settings, how your engine performs, can actually make a big adjustment. So you get to do this, get your, your physicists, get the Siemens or Philips people out, and you can, you can adjust the settings under the hood to really substantially reduce the radiation exposure. So in summary, scatter radiation can be reduced by very simple measures such as adjusting the performance of the system, very careful operator technique. I strongly believe that real-time dose monitoring is an absolutely essential part of any monitoring system program. Cath labs must be replaced in a regular and scheduled fashion to ensure physicians and staff are protected. And if you're not doing this as, as a group, we need to lobby our administrators and hospital leaders to make sure this is on the docket for for as part of the capital replacement cycle. And there are some newer technologies that now available that do provide substantial incremental reductions in radiation dose. But again, don't do this without wearing a real-time dosimeter. So thank you very much for your attention. 
That was outstanding. I think we all learned something there, especially about the height of the table, something simple. Um, my, my university cath lab has a 13-year-old system that regularly gives us three gray and above. Um, how would you approach that discussion with administration? I think as a group, you've got to, got to lobby your, your administrators, and it's unacceptable. Unac so first of all, it's collecting data. So data that how much data, how much radiation that that lab outputs compared to the neighboring cath labs. You know, go to go to the, 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 the systems, show the recent data showing the clear correlation between scatter radiation and harmful effects to interventionalists and lobby them. And if, if not, it's on them. There, there are lawsuits in the country where physicians have um, developed malignancies and so the risk is really on the administrators if they fail to do that. So one other thing I would suggest is if you have like two, three cath labs and they're kind of older or they have high radiation, just go and at least you know, try to negotiate for one new cath lab because most of the problem are with complex cases, you know, CTOs, protected, uh, bigger size patients, and most of them are planned, elective, so uh, you can do those cases in the new lab. And the other thing I was about to mention was the angle of the you know, pictures you are taking. Try to avoid the very steep angles, especially I've seen a lot of fellows try to keep the II where it is and they are doing the wire exchange, cutter exchange. I mean, you really don't need to do that. You can just come to AP, and do it that way and then go back to your angle uh, that you prefer. So that's, that's point, good for sir. patient the skin injury and also radiation dose. If I can give you one other message to take away today, in the cranial views, you get absolutely fried. You get absolutely fried. And I didn't learn this until I had the, the real-time dosimeter because you can see exactly how much radiation you get. When you, you put your, your foot on the cine pedal, you get absolutely fried in a cranial, cranial view. So now my practice is to work, if at all possible, in every single case, in an areocaudal view. And for the major majority of interventions, you can do that and very safely. That was terrific. And I personally wasn't even aware of the real-time dosimetry monitoring that's available. And I think that's the best way to augment your practice in real time and, and improve your, your shielding. Um, for those of us who've never heard of the availability of this, what companies can you direct us to look at you know, to consider for bringing into our hospital? Which are some of the most user-friendly? So, so the RaySafe system, it, it's commercially available. Uh, sometimes it's packaged in with new cath labs, but you can buy it separately. The badges themselves cost about 1500 bucks. The data is stored in a badge, and it just Bluetooths with the display, uh, which you can have in the lab and see exactly what's happened during that case or in real time. Uh, the systems cost about 20 grand. So we're not, we're not talking a large amount of money to do that, but I, I just can't imagine a modern radiation, a modern cath lab program can't function without real-time monitoring. The problem with the RaySafe right now is it's, it can't replace the standard aluminum oxide badges for uh, NRC reporting. The other system, the InstaDose, which Bluetooths to your phone, can actually be used to replace the, the standard uh, aluminum oxide badges. So I think either one is, is, is good. We, we've just had a, we've just used RaySafe at our institution. Great, <clears throat> thank you, Simon. That was terrific. Good. Thank you very and, much. And uh, thank you all for joining us for this session. I think it was a very uh, valuable, informative session, and we appreciate everyone's involvement and the panelists' involvement and the great uh, talks by the speakers. Thank you.